John McDonnell. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This is the first time I've spoken in any of the debates on Iraq, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. This is a time when, when one draws upon one's inner beliefs and votes according to principle. And I just want to put on record for my constituencies, the community in which I live, which I work hard to represent my views so they understand and know what I've done and what I will do today. I will be voting against the war. I'll be wo voting for peace. Yeah. I will be walking through the lobby tonight with many members of the Socialist Campaign Group against the war, but there will be one missing. The member for Bolsover will not be with us tonight, and I send him our best wishes for a speedy recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Last week, in a desperate attempt to gain support for a war position, the Ministry of Truth at number 10 tried to portray the Campaign Group's position as an attempt on the leadership. Let's make it clear, today's vote is nothing to do with the leadership. Today's vote is one on principle. You're either for the war or against it. The Prime Minister himself today has said he does not want people to vote out of loyalty. He wants them to vote on the basis of understanding and supporting the argument. I respect him for that. I would respect him even further if he gave us all a free vote, another three-line whip, and the whips were called off in the lobby next door on the activity that they are pursuing to persuade people in their normal manner. <laughs> but I am voting for peace tonight because the Bush war plan, in my view, is immoral. It fails the test of the basic just war principles, not just of last resort, but also of right intention. I do not accept that Rumsfeld, Cheney and Pearl and Bush have right intention when it comes to the future of Iraq. I believe it is illegal. We cannot just erase the US Ambassador's commitment to the UN Security Council partners that Resolution 1441 held within it no hidden triggers, no automaticity, because that was what was said. I believe many will believe that a war against Iraq will be an act of international vigilantism by a superpower state which is increasingly looking as though it's out of control. I believe we will reap the unforeseen and incalculable consequences for the world for our citizens, our own constituents, for generations to come. And people will suffer, and they will die. And no matter how few it will be, it will be too many for me. If we go to war, we need to be very clear that we have the support of our own people. Over the last, certainly. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. He, he's been very eloquent in telling us what he thinks is unacceptable. Could he tell us how he would bring about the disarmament of the Saddam Hussein regime. We will work through the UN. Yes, we will use weapons inspection. We will use the proposal for UN human rights inspectors. Yeah, yeah. We will support the Iraqi people because a tyrant falls hardest and best when he's pushed by his own people. That's what we will do. We will not bomb them. We will support them. With, I, Certainly. For giving way with his usual courtesy, but isn't that what we hoped would happen in 1991 when we left it to his own people to get rid of him and all that happened was they rose up and they were massived? With the greatest respect to all of them, I don't believe the Basra Road is a good example of supporting the Iraqi people and the carnage that we inflicted on right. many of them. Many of them simply conscripts not willing and not wishing to fight. Let me just continue while I'm short of time. If we go to war, we need to be very clear we have the support of our own people. But over the last 12 months, they've been treated to a global propaganda exercise to persuade us all of the inevitable need to attack Iraq. It's been like a global stream, I have to say, of new, new neighbour-like new labour -like publicity stunts, cynical in their intent and increasingly ineffective in their implementation. Its lasting inheritance is its own inability to tell between truth and fal falsehood, even where lives have been at stake. But most of our people, I have to say, have seen through this global propaganda exercise. The great persuaders have failed to persuade. People have seen through the dodgy dossiers, the forged nuclear weapons evidence. They've been offended by the use of the memories of those that died on September the 11th to justify the dusting off of Rumsfeld's five-year-old plan to invade Iraq. 
They have understood that this war has no link to the war against terrorism and in fact will exacerbate the terrorist threat for years to come. And they have grown wary of pleas to justify war on humanitarian grounds by those whose humanitarian credentials are compromised by the military, economic and political support provided to the tyrant Hussein, and who after 20 years have suddenly discovered the plight of the Iraqi people. Even those that believe Bush would be held to the principles of the UN by the Prime Minister have been rapidly disillusioned. We now know that the Bush military regime had set a timetable for the invasion of Iraq based not on the outcome of UN weapons inspectors, but on the climactic conditions of the Middle East. Yep. A second UN resolution was not an act of faith in the UN and the rule of international law. It was just another part of the propaganda exercise to bring states, and especially the British electorate, on side. When not enough states could be bought or bullied, the UN route was cast aside. The height of cynicism was last week when we were promised the Palestinian-Israeli roadmap. This comes from a president who when Sharon sent his tanks to demolish Jenin and he was forced by world opinion to send Colin Powell to Israel to give Sharon the time to murder more Palestinians, Powell took the longest route from Washington to Tel Aviv in the history of travel. Where was the road map then? And where was it this week when the Israeli bulldozers drove over backwards and forwards over the peace demonstrator, killing her outright? But when the rational argument fails, we find a scapegoat. And who better than the traditional enemy, the French? Yeah. The language against the French that has been used in this debate has verged on xenophobia. Yeah. And yet any criticism of the Bush regime is pounced upon as anti-Americanism. It may be impossible. It may be impossible to prevent the Bush regime going to war. But we can still halt Britain being a party to this international atrocity. Yeah. Our vote tonight could withdraw any moral or political authority to take this country to war. Without the overwhelming support of this House, no Prime Minister can be confident he has the backing of the British people for war, and thus have the right to lead our people into this unknown risk. If the Prime Minister does proceed to take us to war in this coalition, not of the willing, but of the <coughs> killing, I say very clearly, yes. Not in my name, not in the name of thousands of Labour Party members up and down the country, not in the name of the British people. To our communities, we say continue the campaign for peace to shorten this war and prevent the next. To the British troops, we say safe home. To the Iraqi people, to their parents, we say hide your children deep in the shelters. But we wish you safety. We will stand by you when the bombing stops. To the peoples of the world, we say very clearly, we will not let this coalition destroy the United Nations as the arbiter of international order. We must form a new coalition to build institutions of global governance capable of safeguarding the world from the new superpower globally dictating its policy to the rest of the world. Richard Ottaway. Mr. Dep Mr. Deputy Speaker, we, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we conduct this debate here this evening, 18 months after the horror and tragedies of the 11th of September, with our institutions impotent, with no coherent solutions to the threats facing civilization.